three minutes, max cap, beyond three minutes will drag you off the stage screaming and yelling. Yeah. All right? That's the original way Lightning Talks were created at the Python conference, and we're going to do it uh, the original way. So given that context, who wants to come first? Do I have a choice? <laughs> you don't have a choice. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to be a timer. And uh, people could sit in these chairs to line up so <coughs> we know how many people are coming next, please. <coughs> Those are the line of chairs. And I'm going to do the quick timer. It's three minutes. And uh, it would be great if you can quickly introduce yourself and the topic, and we will get started. And that part is not comfortable. No, that's not comfortable. <laughs> Okay, Suma here, Infosys. I'm an agile trainer and coach. Um, so today, uh, my uh, topic of discussion is how to help people uh, learn planning and estimation in agile using flower points. And uh, um, I was um, kind of discussing with uh, Richard and uh, Savita about it. So that's the idea where it comes from. Okay. Um, so planning and estimation is uh, something that we think of in user uh, story. I mean, story points, and that's kind of a difference uh, mindset. So what I do uh, as part of my trainings is uh, take uh, people through a journey of how is a uh, the six layers of uh, agile planning within that release management and actually take them away from IT. I give them a, a real life situation and say, OK, the theme for the day of planning and estimation is probably beautifying this room or beautifying this entire hotel. OK? And then from there, I derive a few uh, backlog items. One of them, I put it purposefully as creating a flower garland, a garland of flowers, paper flowers. Okay, And then I move that into their release goal. Okay, So now they have a release goal. Then we do a hackathon, actually, and I help them actually make up a uh, paper flower. So they actually get a hands-on with a paper flower. They know, and then we do a sprint. When they do a sprint, they realize how many paper flowers they're able to do in one single uh, sprint. And that's where they derive a uh, flower point. So they start relating to uh, the whole concept of doing flower point, uh, which is like your story point. And from there, they derive what is their velocity. And from there, they derive how they would uh, probably, how much time would they would take to do the entire garland, which is a release goal. So uh, starting from what is your flower point to your um, uh, what is your uh, velocity to you what is your release goal. So. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Pooja Vandile. I'm from Persistent Systems Pune. Uh, my, in fact, it's not a lightning talk. It's more of a debate. We know that project manager is not needed in an agile project or a scrum project. Uh, we have also started thinking about do we need a dedicated scrum master also. We have uh, you know, reached a situation where the scrum masters are asking us, you know, Pooja, I don't have any work. Do I really need to be on the project? Maybe that person was needed when the project was new, when the processes were needed to be set up. Now, once the team has settled down, there is a rhythm which is there. They are producing a good velocity. Everything is there. Scrum master actually doesn't have any work for the all those 10 days or 15 days, at least for those eight hours. So we are in a situation where do you really need a dedicated scrum master? You know, That's how it starts, that you shouldn't have part-time scrum master, but full-time scrum masters. But I don't have work from my scrum masters. So maybe uh, it will really help if you tell me what are the things that the scrum masters can do. In, I'm not talking about the meeting setups or the metrics dashboard. Maybe those are the things that are initially needed. Maybe put things in Jira, derive those metrics, dashboard, that's all. You know, But after that, from the second day until the 14th day, if it's a three-week sprint, actually, all technical things are decided by the teams. They you know, handle those impediments, dependencies, requirement dependencies are handled by the BAs. Even there, he is not needed. So what he or she is supposed to do? You know, estimation, again, there is not much that person is contributing because it's the BA and you know, technical people, they are deciding what should be the story points and all those things. So we are, we are in a situation where we are trying to find out work for the Scrum Masters. No, so you have both addresses, right? Either you make somebody from the team. So maybe when the project starts, you have a dedicated Scrum Master who will set up things. But as the... As part of the team, he should be part of the team doing the development work as well, you know, on a day-to-day. -day. Yeah, but both 
sides are there, right? You can have a dedicated Scrum Master, you can have somebody from the team playing both the roles, you know, either as a developer tester and the second part is the Scrum Master also. But that's what the idea we started with and we are kind of reaching to a situation where we said that you don't need a dedicated Scrum Master. You don't need a full-time Scrum Master. Maybe somebody from the team can do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So we are, but that's what the situation of our Scrum Masters is, you know, they are getting into. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> no, believe me, that's... <laughs> okay, that's all. No, but the, we are into that situation. They, they are not adding too much of a value, you know. No, even the teams, they are deciding, you know, in terms of process improvement, they know if the build is failing, you know, the configuration management person is there or that developer is there, why the build has failed. That Scrum Master is not adding any value, why the build failed. It's the developer and the uh, you know, configuration management. Yeah, visit, very stressful. That's what I'm saying. Those 13 days, not much work. Okay, thanks. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Yashasri and I'm from TCS, Data Consultancy Services. Uh, working as an architect, uh, come portfolio lead, come developer uh, in Scrum projects since 2008 now. So um, I wanted to share, I wanted to share a story of uh, a campaign that we did in, in our teams. Uh, you know, we started in 2008 and we started uh, learning, you know, first couple of years were more of learning and things like that. And then we found like, even though teams were doing individual ret retrospectives and trying to improve, there were overall, there was a stagnation kind of, you know, that enthusiasm and energy about practicing agile and doing something more and giving value had subsided. So we did a campaign uh, which was known as Reduce Waste Campaign. And it was basically an idea storm where uh, we encouraged teams to give uh, their ideas as to you know um, how can we reduce the waste in the current process and it actually went very well you know we did a lot of campaigning and uh, some of the folks give ideas that we actually took ahead and implemented so some of the ideas that uh, we implemented was one one challenge so earlier we were doing a two week sprint and a three months release and fr from there we actually moved on to one week sprint and one month release it took time but we have got used to it, and that's the norm for the new teams as well now. The second thing that came up was a lot of processes in terms of deployments. I mean, because this has been an enterprise, there were a lot of processes to push things across environments, you know, a lot of security concerns, infrastructure-related concerns, and so on. So people, you know, people loved the way Heroku works, right? Uh, everybody um, in the, who is familiar with Ruby Rails would know what is Heroku, and it's just a one command deployment, and people wanted to go there. So um, that was another idea which we actually went ahead and uh, uh, tried to implement. So it actually took us a lot of time. This was through a DevOps uh, initiative that we did. So we actually had to talk to a lot of people, uh, you know, try and understand the enterprise level constraints. Uh, what is it that the security team wants? What is it that you know the, the infrastructure team wants and so on? And uh, what we felt is maybe we can go ahead and build a product um, ourselves or custom application, to be frank, not to market to the people that can actually take in all of these enterprise level constraints and give the developers the flexibility like Heroku does. And we actually were successful in it. So we have created a custom app which is Deployer, which is actually a one-click deployment across environments. So uh, basically as a takeaway, what I wanted to share was that uh, any teams who start uh, adopting Agile will become you know, stagnant at some time. And uh, or may become standard stagnant at some time, but then we shouldn't stop. And the whole uh, spirit and principle behind adopting agile is continuous improvement. So we should definitely go ahead and do that, and it will keep that energy and uh, enthusiasm sustained within the teams. Thank you very much. For data consultancy services, I picked up only 14 out of 32 I collected because it's going to be a 19 talk. So first misconception is that agile is new. Some of them feel think, but it's not new because all of us know that uh, you know, uh, the Agile Manifesto was uh, prepared in 2001, February 2001, so it's not new. And in fact, the Scrum uh, pattern language was uh, introduced way back in 1995, so 
that's not new. So uh, actually, uh, all of us know that it's uh, prevalent, agile is prevalent, it works very well. And uh, it has a better success rate vis-a-vis -vis, uh, so many other traditional uh, methodologies. Do you have uh, any data on that? Sorry? Do you have any data on that? Uh, not really, but uh, I have not. That's a I don't have the source. That's a myth. That's a myth that agile projects work better than waterfall projects. Uh, I have I have uh, come across a few statistics a few days back. I can uh, I can send you the uh, link. Uh, of course, there are challenges even in the agile projects, but I'm only, I'm only giving the comparative figures. I'm not saying that uh, they are the best in every every situation. I think it depends. What do you mean by better? Right? You mean better quality software, less time to market. What is better? No, he made a statement saying it's more successful, and I, I challenge that. More I, successful, I, yeah. More successful, so more successful. I but of course, there are. It doesn't mean that hundred percent will have success rate. No. Well, if if uh, where I've seen I more have, agile projects fail than waterfall projects. I don't like it because I have seen about forty-five percent. Like I have seen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, maybe I don't know what I've seen. I, I can share. I can share that. Uh, so all I'm trying to say is it's a myth, uh, and let's move on. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, other thing is, uh, uh, people feel that Agile is not uh, plan oriented just because you know there is no upfront uh, uh, big detailed plan unlike in traditional projects. So it's not the case. Uh, it's continuous. It's incremental. I know uh, it's very clearly explained even in the onion uh, diagram that you know the planning happens at high level in the right from the release plan and it goes on up to the daily planning through the daily meetings. Okay. Uh, next. Agile means no documentation. It's not true. This mis misconception comes from one of the values saying that working software is more important compared to the comprehensive documentation. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't require any documentation. It requires, but it should be just enough documentation. In fact, that can be one of the delivery as well. Uh, the team must take direction from and support this scrum master. It's not so. Uh, we, uh, this is where the people go wrong because they come from the traditional dogmas that uh, we take orders for the project manager. Here, in fact, even in daily meeting, you shouldn't even look at the Scrum Master. You are addressing the team and you are uh, working as a team. Next, you have Agile is a bullet solution for software engineering problems. I'll give you one more minute. Okay, thanks. So it's not a bullet solution. Uh, it, it, is, uh, it cannot be suitable for all types of projects, as I said. Then you have poor pair programming. The, uh, the other myth is that pair programming is a myth. I mean, uh, is uh, very advantageous. Again. There are cases that many times, uh, if the pairing is not properly done, it can actually work the other way around. So uh, it's very important that uh, the properly uh, synced uh, pair of programmers are pairing, and then there is a better productivity and better output. Uh, Agile produces poor quality output. Uh, this is uh, a bit uh, I have heard sometimes, but actually, because of the frequent inspect and adopt cycles, uh, through various scrum ceremonies like daily stand-up, the sprint reviews, or sprint retrospectives, there are many chances of improving upon, and uh, this is not true. Agile only works for trivial projects. No, there have been projects of uh, you know highly scientific projects where Agile has been implemented successfully. Next, Agile is always a better option when compared to the other alternatives. No, it's not. It's not the case. There can be actually a blend depending <coughs> on the type of project that we have. Developers get to do. All right, thank you, sir. Sorry. Big fact program, and how we use Agile practices. I'll tell you my name and where I come from at the end when he rings the bell. Okay, because I want to give you the story that's more important than me. I'm talking about this program, which runs for 10 years. And uh, the scope that we have is uh, implementing a product, also managing a data center. In fact, we are managing the scheme for uh, our customer. So. office, assurance, everything, right up to even sending documents by courier to the customer, to the end customer. It's just a turnkey project. So the, what does the customer do? They give requirements and they do oversight. That's all. And they pay the money or they just, you know, penalize us. That's all they do. And of course, they impose a whole lot of regulations for every single part of it, whether it's a security, uh, you know, certification, Health certification or you know what's it called disability uh, related certification for front air everything is just regulations and regulations for almost every <coughs> part of this program and uh, so it's about 300 people and across many many different locations so as you can see there's a huge amount
amount of uh, collaboration required stakeholders. So a lot of churn, a lot of rework, a lot of communication gaps, and it was very tough, very tough, and we really struggled. And uh, so I happened to work in that uh, program, which was very, it was, initially it was just a nightmare. And then what happened after about, about uh, towards about 11 months or so, what we decided to do, you know, it started going into, it went for a release, and then we also had production support, help desk, everything coming into our own uh, responsibility. So that latter part of the life cycle is also ours because we have to run it for 10 years. And then what did we do? So we came upon this, actually, uh, it's not about somebody sitting there and saying, do this. People started, as they always do, they just improved right up, bottom up. And what did they do? You know, the testers, they started giving feedback to the product teams and the development teams, saying that these are the areas. They came up with this estimation model. If you're going to touch this piece, I think I'm going to take at least three cycles. This piece, I think I'm going to take only one cycle. So then they started giving that feedback. And the developers immediately got to know that, OK, this is where these guys have a very good idea of where we make mistakes. So even if the people change in that team, those are inherently complex pieces of the product and the customization. So they started working on it. Then the UI teams, they started giving feedback to security. So each place, so the security, you know, people on the performance testing side, they knew that security and we are going to have non-conflict, conflicting requirements because three minutes up. So it's similarly, then the BPO uh, back office, front office, they said, if you're going to design it this way, we are going to take longer to answer people. We cannot meet this you know, answer within so many seconds. So what happened was a fantastic, beautiful collaborative effort of people coming together during the requirements phase, straightening out right from production support up to the domain business analyst, all different parts of the team, they got together and they did a whole lot of mistake proofing. And uh, it came to a stage where it's running beautifully. We've cut down time to market, quality is just shot up and we've got lots of very good appreciations and uh, service credits and other things have really come down, okay? So th thank you, my name is Radhika, I'm from TCS. I work for this program. I'm also in the SMAC area, Agile Lean Evangelist. I'm gonna talk about velocity is killing agility, right? Uh, we heard some beautiful lightning talks before this about how you do story point estimation and how beautiful story point estimation is. I think we completely missed the point. Uh, the guys who actually came up with story points uh, discarded it right away because they said that's a stupid idea. Uh, and we seem to be running crazy behind it, right? Uh, anyone's aware who came up with story points idea? No, but yeah, we, we can dance around fire and God will gift stuff from the top, right? Because uh, <laughs> It was originally uh, Ward Cunningham's idea uh, of uh, basically trying to create a level of indirection. Uh, and then, you know, you can talk to Ward Cunningham. He seems to have discarded that idea long back. Uh, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about what is the problem with uh, story points, and then we'll come to velocity, because without story points, you really cannot have an effective velocity calculation, at least the way it's done these days. Uh, so if you look at story points, the most common story point mechanism these days is to use Fibonacci series, uh, right? Everyone agrees with that? So uh, what was the reason behind choosing Fibonacci series? Why didn't they just pick one, two, three, four, five? The reason behind picking Fibonacci series was? Non-linear, non right? Uh, so that's very important. It's non-linear. Uh, uh, what does that mean? That means if a story point is, you know, so you do one, two, three, uh, and five, and seven. So five is not, you know, five times more effort than one, right? Uh, and it's not also about effort estimation. It was about relative sizing or relative complexity estimate, right? Uh, and the idea was to try and bucket things into different categories so it will help us get an indication of how we can incorporate these things into the upcoming sprint. Uh, but what ended up happening was basically uh, we took story points, we totaled them up, and we said, okay, this was the velocity that I achieved last sprint, right? So let's say you did a three-pointer story and a five-pointer story and a 10-pointer story. So you said, okay, my estimate is now, my velocity was 15 story points because that's what I achieved last time. 
Next print, if you took 15 one-pointer stories, what would happen? You will never be able to finish 15 story point estimates. There is no doubt about that. You will never be able to finish 15 one-pointer stories uh, in, in the same duration that you did three story points because it's non-linear. If it was linear, then yes, you could take 15 story points and you could easily do them, 15 one-pointer stories. But the whole point was that it's non-linear and we completely missed it, right? The, the rationale behind it was we didn't want to apply arithmetic and statistics on it. Uh, but we went back to applying arithmetic and statistics on it and then teams getting measured by velocity and teams, you know, management going crazy with it. So agility is killing velocity. What's the goal of your scrum team? To Produce more software faster? Better quality. Uh, I, I really better think. Teamwork. I mean, there's lots of uh, behavioral uh, indicators which I could set. You know? uh, I, I think one of the things a lot of people talk about is output versus outcome. So you could focus a lot on output, which is velocity or capacity planning, capacity utilization, or you could focus on outcome, which is little more than throughput, right, which is delivering value, which is actually seeing users doing. Someone walked up to me and said, our management is really pushing hard to deliver more and more stuff. And, you know, Agile is the way to do that, right, because Agile is about faster delivery. And it's like, no, Agile was about doing less, right? You, you, you deliver faster because you do less, not because you do more. So I think you should focus on how little you're delivering and still adding value. That would be the KPI I would look at, not how much crap I can generate how fast. In fact, we have started focusing more on the business value delivered than velocity. In, in one of the projects, we had a very good velocity, but the business value delivered was so poor that the product actually did not succeed in the market. And then later on, we realized we have not really focused on the values which, we, you know, the features that we wanted to deliver. The velocity was good, but the, but the product didn't do well. So what's the use of that velocity? So now we just focus more, it's not like we don't, Look at velocity, but the focus is more on the business value. All right, time out. Thank you.